When we go on road trips, maybe to go camping or to visit grandparents, we like to play lots of games, maybe listen to an audiobook. Sometimes we share riddles to pass the time. Do you know any good riddles? I think we all love riddles. Riddles are stories with obscure meanings. We hear riddles and we try and try to figure them out on our own, but sometimes we can't. Once someone explains a riddle, the meaning is so obvious. Let's try one and see what happens. I'm going to share a riddle with you. My thunder comes before the lightning. My lightning comes before the clouds. My rain dries all the land that it touches. What am I? Does anybody know? Lots of quizzical faces. Can't figure it out? We're going to get back to it in a bit. But first, did you know the Bible is full of riddles? Stories whose meanings are sometimes difficult to figure out, but once they're explained, they make a lasting impression. Riddles are often used in times of oppression and persecution to conceal what the writer is really saying so that you don't get hurt. Jesus loved to speak in riddles. We usually call these parables. Jesus spoke in riddles to communicate with his followers the truths to be kept secret from people who might hurt them. I wonder if in today's scripture you'll be able to tell the meaning of the riddle in one of our readings. Maybe if you're able, before those readings, I encourage you to get a piece of paper and doodle out the words that you hear Elaine read. Thus the Lord, thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of cedar. I will set it out and I will break off a tender one from the utmost of its young twigs. Maybe this is less riddly than some. Maybe you hear Ezekiel sp speaking plainly. But Ezekiel does have another riddle right after that. Listen. Under it, every bird will live, and in the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. And all of the trees in the field shall know that I am the Lord. What could this mean? every kind of bird, and all of the trees in the field? How about a hint? The key to understanding this riddle is to focus on the words every and all. The kingdom of God is for everyone. Bring the low, bring low the high tree. I will make high the low tree. So there are high and green trees. There are low and dry trees. These will be reversed. I wonder how you would answer this riddle. What are the trees? Where are you in this mystery? Finally, let's solve our first riddle. Remember when I said it? My thunder comes before the lightning. My lightning before the clouds. My rain dries up all the land it touches. What am I? The answer, a volcano. Now let us get ready for our time of worship together. With the sound of soft music, let us center ourselves. With the reminder of Christ always with us in love, shining through the world, through the lighting of the candle, let us be present together. With the candle we light and the candles lit on our candle table, let us uphold the prayers given for those who send them and those who receive them. Let the love poured out provide comfort and hope. We begin this morning, as we usually do, by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 7 traditional territory, the land of the Nitsitapi, the Sutina, and the Nakoda peoples, and the Métis Nation, Region 3. 
And this morning we're going to particularly talk about this land, or land in general, the earth around us, the growth that comes from it. And as we do this together, I would welcome you to sense, no matter where you are or who you are, that you are a part of our community, because we are an open community. As an affirming congregation in the United Church, we welcome members of the LGBTQ plus community. And as followers of Christ, we welcome all people who are seeking truth, who are seeking to be part of that humanity that lives on the earth with care and with wonder and in love. And this morning, I would also remind you that at this time, we still need money, we need offerings, we need support to keep this community and our community at large going. Let's begin by singing. You can sing at home if you wish, or just sit back and listen to Charlotte as she sings and Sandy plays. We're going to do I Can Feel, I Can Feel You Near Me, God, uh, voices, uh, more voices, actually, 48, and Spirit of God, Be Our Breath, more voices, 150. Be 
For our opening prayer this morning, we're going to do a meditative prayer, as we've done on other occasions. Uh, I have been asked, why do you do these prayers? These are prayers where we stand or sit or put our bodies in some configurations. Uh, one thing is that it makes prayer more intentional. When we involve our bodies in what we're doing, it rather makes our meaning clearer. It helps us to remember. It helps us to feel whatever we're thinking about or talking about. We're not just minds, but we're bodies active in the world. Uh, one place, by the way, you can put that into action right now is if you're learning a foreign language, one way to learn the vocabulary faster is to write down, physically write, if you remember how to do that, the words the mind remembers. So today we're going to put our body into three basic positions and reflect on our lives, reflect on our connection with God in prayer. I would ask you throughout this, if you're standing, try to keep upright with your head as if it's being hung from a string. No, no pressure, but just balanced perfectly on the top of the spine. If you find it hard to keep your hands in any particular position, just let them drop. And if you find it hard to stand or can't stand at this time, just be where you are, listen to the words I'm saying, listen to the thoughts, and follow them wherever the Spirit takes you. So with that in mind, we're going to reflect today on our growth and the growth of the world around us. And first, uh, by the way, eyes open or shut. If you're standing, it's actually better to keep the eyes open but unfocused. So pick a point, as a dancer would, pick a point and just see 180 degrees but don't necessarily see anything in particular. Uh, you can close your eyes if that makes you feel better, except if you're standing and you close your eyes, you're apt to sway quite a bit. Don't fall over. Let us pray. I'd like you to begin by simply taking your hands and act as if you're holding in front of you a very, very large beach ball. Imagine it's a great ball of energy that you have, that you're holding, that that's part of who you are. And as you imagine this, reflect upon and give thanks for the power that you have, the talents, the skills, that are within you. The things you're able to do, perhaps just daily things like cooking meals or walking down the street or helping someone. Think of those things and give thanks that you have within you a strength to be active in the world and in such a way transform the world by your actions. Give thanks to God and feel that strength within you. Now let's move our hands up. Don't put them above your eyebrows. Uh, this is not what it's called in Qigong, but I look upon it as the looking over the wall posture. And think of yourself standing behind the wall and looking over it. You're protected. The wall is in front of you. You aren't going to be overwhelmed by the wind or the fire or whatever is beyond it. But you're looking over it and look out into that future. You can't see it clearly. None of us know what's going to happen. None of us really even know where we're going, but it's there. Find those things in the coming week that you're looking forward to and give thanks that you're able to do them. Perhaps it's getting together with friends at a safe distance. Perhaps it's cooking a special meal for someone or in some way celebrating something. Perhaps it's just being out and about and, and doing your regular work in the world, which you see as the work of Christ. But see also those things that you fear, those things about which you're uncertain, those things which you find hard to face. And ask yourself, which of these may be able to be set aside? So often we take upon ourselves tasks that we're not very good at and maybe shouldn't even be doing and have the courage to set them aside. And as for those other things that we must do and they're difficult, remember that as you're out there, the wall of protection, the wall of God's love will surround you always. And finally, continuing to breathe slowly, put your hands down at your side Stand tall and just allow yourself to realize that we are in the presence of God. 
God who gives us our power, who places the good and the challenging before us and yet who is always with us. And allow yourself to sense that you are being washed over by the Spirit of God, moving through you, moving your thoughts, energizing your body, and giving you life. And for this, give thanks at all times. Amen. Our first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 to 24. Thus says the sovereign God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am God. I will bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, God, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Our second reading is from Mark 4, verses 26 to 34. Jesus also said, The realm of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. The sower does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once the sower goes in with the sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the realm of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parents, The stories of the Judeo-Christian tradition begin in the Garden of Eden planted by God. And they end in the new creation, in paradise, again created by God. And just as a footnote, paradise is simply an old Persian word for a walled garden. So we have this great stretch of agricultural storytelling from Genesis right through to Revelation. Almost every book of the Bible mentions farming, growing, harvesting in some way. Or another. And uh, for example, in this morning's two stories, the one we have God as the gardener, God taking a branch, replanting it, nurturing it, watering it, giving it sun, allowing it to grow and to flourish. The imagery being taking Israel out of Babylon, bringing them back home and replanting them and allowing them to grow with strength on Mount Zion. And then in the reading from Christian scripture, we have Jesus talking about the sower out in the field, broadcasting his seeds across the dry land to bring greenness, to bring harvest, to bring new hope. Great stories. And all this agricultural talk throughout the Bible isn't really a surprise because, like us, Agriculture was central. Now, we often don't realize or think about this in our lives because our produce is just there. You go to the store and the shelves are full. And we know that it's going to be that way. Of course, in the ancient world, they weren't quite as abundant in the food they had around them as we are. 
basically because they were far more attached to their own local area. I mean, if co-op finds out that the grapes in California aren't any good, they'll buy grapes from somewhere else. And we have this worldwide market from which to draw. Unfortunately, for the ancients, they bought locally out of sheer necessity. And if there was a failure of a crop, it meant starvation for a whole region of the world. And thus it was that they kept their eyes and very closely on what was happening in the fields around them. They were quite aware of that agricultural basis on which uh, all civilization stands. And this thinking about agriculture, about gardening, shows up in their literature. So this morning, I'd like to look at a few of these predominant themes of growing and harvesting that we find throughout Scripture and look at them from a theological point of view. All right, first, how many gardeners do we have here? Don't point at other people. Yes, all right. Anybody back there? No, no, no. All right, uh, all right, 50% of the people at Woodcliffe are gardeners. We just did this in a very scientific study. Uh, there's an idea, by the way, I'm going to talk to Sherry now. There's an idea. What we can do is we can set up a gardening hotline. And people can, put, uh, we get all our gardeners here at, at Woodcliffe to uh, be a part of this group, and people can send in their questions, like, why didn't the palm tree I planted last fall last through the winter? And we can answer those questions. All right, it's just an idea. We don't need to do it. The first thing I'd like to note, though, today is that the very imagery of gardening is quite reflective of how we should live our lives. It's, it's primarily about growth. It's about encouraging, nurturing that growth within ourselves, within the community, and within the world around us. It's pretty well everything we say on Sunday morning, we do in a garden. Now, the first point is, of course, that gardening always has a very tangible, visible purpose. We know what we're doing. We're going to go out, and we're going to turn this area of land into something that's beautiful, and flowering and has plants that are giving us food and looks magnificent. It's something that we can envision and then take that vision and go out and make it real. It's, ex it's exciting. It's, uh, it gives us a sense of real purpose in life because we can actually experience what we're doing. It's wonderful this time of year, maybe above all, when the Perennials are in, the annuals are in, we sit out in the garden and look around and say, yeah, we did this. We made this and it's beautiful. Or that, that first tomato you get off the vine. You take it in, you put it on the cutting board, you slice it and you say, this is our tomato. We grew it. We put the nutrients into the earth when they were needed. We watered it. We made sure it was in a good spot. And now from this plant, it was so small when we got it, we're now getting tomatoes. It, it's a wonderful feeling. And so often, unfortunately, in our daily lives, in the work that we do, this is not an experience that we get very often. You know, I, I put numbers in a computer all day, and those numbers came from over there to me, and I put them in this format and send them over there to that person who sends them off to other people and they do things and then, then finally somewhere out there uh, the company produces dungle dinks and they sell them. But I really have no part of that. I just do a little repetitive job day after day and it really doesn't have any, any tangible sense of reward to it. And I would strongly suggest that we need that tangible sense of reward in our lives. That's what we're meant to be. We are the creative power of God, alive and conscious in the world. And, and we should, all of us should, in some way, see that what we're doing, how we live, the actions we take, do make a real, obvious difference in the world, in the society around us. And I would suggest if you're saying, yeah, but I don't have any talent, I don't really, you know, not really able to do anything, find something to do. Whether it's beading or making quilts or writing, find something. I mean, it can be something physical like painting or it can be something that's involved in creating something in the community like a, a book club or a gamers group or something. 
Other people, of course, say, yeah, but I, you know, I'm not very good at anything. Well, it's not a matter of being good. It's a matter of just doing it and enjoying it. A few years ago, I took a Chinese art course up at the University of Calgary because I, I've always loved Chinese landscape painting, which is based on very different principles than most Western painting. Now, I am a horrendously terrible physical artist. As I think I've said before, my good friend Blaine Marler says that my arms are simply painted on. They don't really have any, any functional purpose. So I didn't paint well. All of my paintings have been sadly lost to history because when I got home, they went out. But I loved the course. I was learning something. I was seeing that I could make lines that, that make some difference, that, that have some life to them. And we need that. So from gardening, we learn that we are people of creation. We are people who can create. And in doing so, we do find a real sense of purpose. We're not just out there planting petunias because it's, it's a job to do. But rather, we're exposing, we're expressing our inner self, who we really are. This garden is a reflection of my creativity. This, this piece of paper, this group, I've done it. Thanks be to God. And then gardening also asks us to pose the very pertinent questions, what am I nurturing? What am I really doing? What am I choosing in life to give my time to, to put my effort into? In gardening, for example, we have to make choices. Am I going to plant petunias or pansies this year? We have to sometimes move plants from one place where they're not doing well and take them over to another place where we hope, anyway, they will do better. And then, of course, as was expressed in the Ezekiel reading, we need to do pruning. You know, cut off the bits that just are dead and useless and, and aren't working at all. Gardening activities, but they're there in our everyday lives. We make choices. We make choices of the things we do. And so often, you know, it's very interesting. We get caught up in doing things and even feel we have to do things, people expect that we'll do things that really aren't that useful, that really aren't serving any great purpose. They're just part of our lives. I had only one sabbatical during my pre-retirement ministry. And I remember after I came back from that, after two or three months, I began to realize that many of the things that I had done regularly, little tasks that I'd given myself to do, I'd forgotten about, and I wasn't doing them. And the shock to me was, and this, this is always sad, that nobody noticed. You know, I used to put a little note up on the board every week saying who was in the hospital. That was my job. I did it. I spent my time. Nobody noticed it wasn't there. They could find out who was in the hospital. It was easy enough. And I think that sort of thinking we need to do in our lives, we need to say, okay, I'm very, very busy. I know I'm busy. I sometimes complain I'm busy. But what am I doing that I really don't need to do? What am I nurturing in my garden that really doesn't need nurturing? It doesn't need to be there. And the same thing with pulling things out or, or moving things. You know, over time, priorities in life change. Uh, as our situation changes, as we grow, as we understand ourselves and our lives better, we need to be able then to change and not simply to get caught in a great rut. A lot of our frustration comes from the fact that we sort of see a path ahead of us and say, well, that's it. I guess I'm on this path. And we forget that, no, you can make changes in the garden. You can move things around. Again, I knew a young man years ago who came from a family of doctors, well-known doctors in the community. Everybody knew those doctors. And they expected that this son of one of them would go to medical school. Of course he would. There's no question about it. And he got well through his course. I don't know how far he got, but he suddenly realized, this isn't who I am. I need to move somewhere else. I need to do something else. This is, this is not the life that's going to give me fulfillment. It's like gardening. You know, we have to move this plant over here because it's not doing well where it is. We sometimes need to move ourselves to a different, sometimes physical, but quite often psychological space in order to really find the growth and the vitality within ourselves. And then, of course, there's pruning. Pruning is that thing I always enjoy at time of, this time of year. Uh, we have a mayday tree in the back of our house, and I, I think I cut off about a complete mayday tree every year from it, and yet it keeps growing, and it's necessary. But we sometimes just need to say things, stop. This, this is no 
longer a good idea. Uh, there's an old sketch with, sketch with Bob Newhart, and if you know him, you remember his very slow and dry sense of humor. And in it, he plays a psychiatrist, and a patient comes in and uh, has a problem, and he said, that's fine. I charge $5 for the first five minutes, and the rest of the time is free. And she finds this a little bit difficult to take, but it's certainly a good deal. And she said, but won't, won't it take longer? And Bob said, oh, no, five minutes is all people need with me. And so she, she said, fine. And he said, now, what's your problem? And she said, well, I have a great fear of being buried alive. And so Bob asked her, you know, have you been buried alive? Well, no, I've never been buried alive. Uh, has anyone threatened to bury you alive? Well, no, no one's really threatened to be buried alive. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you three words. And she starts to write them down. He says, you won't need to write them down. It's only three words. And the three words are, just stop it. And she said, but you know what? When I go to sleep at night, I just stop it. Well, sometimes I think, just stop it. And that's the end of the skit. Now, I realize that any of the major phobias or psychological problems we have are not solved by saying, just stop it. But, you know, it's a good place to begin those things that seem to take us off life's path and, and lead us into places that are dry and barren and won't give us life, we need to say, just stop it. I'm not going there. Any of the things that we carry with us that we do not need to take, you just stop carrying them. Leave them behind. Go off into life. It's mental imagery, as I said in the prayer, but it helps us to grow. And finally, we need to realize that we are a part of the garden of the world. That may seem strange, but just think about the Bible. Genesis 2, God creates the world. It's all finished. It's all done. And then God says, you know, there is no one to till the ground. No one who's actually going to do the work out there. There's no one who's going to be a part of this, an active, conscious part. And so then God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there God put the man whom God had formed. Out of the ground, the sovereign God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, underlying the Hebrew story, there's an original Babylonian story which has a slightly different ending, a very interesting ending. In it, the gods in paradise, in the big walled garden, realize there's no one to serve them their drinks. So they create humans as sort of servants. That's exactly what they were. They, they were the ones who would serve the gods at the table. The Hebrew story changes that. It said, no, no, we're, we're not servants of, the God, of God. In, in the sense that we're just here to, to trudge around and do little tasks over and over again. No, we're here to be a part of the world, to prune it, to move the plants, to change the plantings, to, to create the patterns. We're here to be conscious participants in the work of God in the world. That's a wonderful thing to think about. And indeed, it, it changes our view of the world and I think this was well summed up by David Suzuki, who said this. The way we see the world shapes the way we treat it. If a mountain is a deity, not a pile of ore, if a river is one of the veins of the land, not potential irrigation water, if a forest is a sacred grove, not timber, if other species are biological kin, not resources, or if the planet is our mother, not an opportunity, then we will treat each other with greater respect. This is the challenge, to look at the world from a, dis distant, from a different perspective. To look at the world from a different perspective. It's not us here and the world over there and we'll just do things to it or it will give us things. We're out there working. We're the gardeners. We're, we're bringing about the vitality of the world, not crushing it. We're bringing about the vitality of other people because we're nurturing them. That, that's the image of who we are, and it so changes the way that we often see things. It's not about, well, there's a profit in this. It's, ah, there's a value in this. 
and it asks us to pose that ultimate question, how effective are we in our gardening? How effective are we in, in nurturing ourselves and making sure that we have what we need in order to grow and to thrive and survive? How effective are we in our communities, making sure there's life and that everyone has a place where they can find their, their true meaning, their true purpose. They can take their visions and turn them into something wonderful. How good are we at working with the world around us to create the abundance that's meant to be there? and to share that abundance with all people. How good are we at being a part of the realm of God? Jesus said, with what can we compare the realm of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. We're here to be a part of that growth, to encourage it, and to love the world of which we are a part in the name of Christ. And for this, thanks be to God. Sacred. 
Let us pray. Let us pause and think of the world around us, the world we are called upon to nurture and to love, the society that we are summoned to help to grow into something better, something with more justice and more compassion. We celebrate today that this is Pride Month and we are a part of that as a community recognizing all people, recognizing that we are different and yet in spirit united in, with the ability to love one another and to reach out with hope to the world around us. We think of the people of this community of Woodcliffe, those who are hurting, those who are facing operations, those who are recovering, those who are worried about family and friends, those who are worried about their own livelihood or their own businesses. There is much around us that needs care. May as we go back out into the world today, may we know that we are able to give that care for we are the people of Christ, sharing in our lives the abundant, overwhelming love of God. We think of the indigenous people in this country still mourning the loss of the children in the residential school in British Columbia, but also in a sense with maybe more hope than before because it seems that we are finally awakening to the fact that our treatment of the native peoples was not just something that was not good. It was something that was flavored with genocide and hatred and as we learn this lesson and seek to make this a better country, may we go out with new visions, seeking a better future for all. We remember those killed by the car in London, Ontario. Family almost completely wiped out by a force of hatred, misunderstanding. And as we live our lives, may we commit ourselves more fully to tackling this kind of horrendous behavior wherever we see it, little remarks that are made, racial slurs, racial slurs that are given, wherever we see inequality, wherever we see people being treated different because of their race or religion, sexual orientation or education or economic status, may we be those who speak and act as the people of Christ, bringing new life to this society. The job is large, O oh God. The garden is broad. Many weeds need pulled. Many plants need watered and nurtured and pruned. But help us to see that together, we are a force that can do these things. And believing this, let us say together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, Mother, who is in the heavens, may your name be made holy. May your dominion come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread we need and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not put us to the test, but rescue us from evil. For yours is the dominion and the power and the glory forever. Amen. From prayer, we quite naturally move to action and the announcements for this week. Did you know that our pastoral care team has a very active group within them called the Prayer Chain? This group of dedicated volunteers is here to support you when you would like extra prayers for anything at all. Contact them by email in confidence at wucprayerchain at gmail.com. Coming soon. We are planning to send the next edition of Messenger a little bit later than you may be expecting. 
We are planning an exciting summer series and want you to be sure to be able to share it with all the information you need. And this is on its way right now. If you are checking your mail daily in anticipation, is anyone checking their mail daily? Yes, yes, 100% of Woodcliffe is checking their mail daily in anticipation. You may take a break until later in June. If you need more details about anything in the meantime, please contact the church office. And finally, next week on June 22nd, uh, Women of Woodcliffe, WOW, will be hosting a lawn gathering to bless the worry dolls before they journey into the hands of kids who need them the most. You're invited to join with your own mask, lawn chair, and picnic lunch. We will maintain social distance for this event as provincial restrictions start to ease. Things to do, lots of things to do. Please be a part of them and sense this community as a nurturing group of people within Calgary. And with those expectations, let us go now in peace. Go out into God's garden. Go out into the world and be gardeners. In all you do, be people who nurture, people who vision, people who create, people to enjoy the world we have been given as a gift from God. Amen.